All right, so Steven Stamp, Stamp Lacrosse, Stamp Lax, IL Indoor editor and author. Wow, another crazy week. It didn't go the way I wanted to with my Firewolves, but I tell you, you cannot be disappointed with how exciting that game was to watch. Well, actually pretty wide open. Even Las Vegas sitting in last place is not mathematically eliminated. It'd be pretty tough for them to make it. They'd have to win all their games, and a lot of things would have to go perfectly because, you know, having lost 10 games, they've lost a bunch of tiebreakers. Things would have to really fall in very specific ways. But still, here we are a week uh, through 17 weeks, and every team still in the playoff race. So, and I actually am going to talk about that some more in my uh, musings on on Inside Cross on IL Indoor. But uh, everyone's talking about the unified standings being the reason for that. And I have to point out it's not. <laughs> I like unified standings. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I, I think it makes sense. It's more fair because the best teams are getting in. But it's, it's really not when you look at the breakdown of the standings. Um, and I go into that in some detail. And I'll, I'll talk about that more. I think that, honestly, the biggest change is one that went along with the unified standings. And that is the balanced schedule where everyone's playing the same number of games against everyone. Like you don't have teams playing some teams, not for a couple of years and other teams three times a year. Um, it's much more balanced and that makes a huge difference. No. Yeah. That, that is huge. Watching uh, the Firewolves go up and play Calgary. Owen was super excited to be able to actually watch the Firewolves and I'm sure super excited with the way the, uh, the game turned out, yeah. but it was, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of these games you're seeing around you know, that 10 digit mark, everybody seems to be hovering right around there. I mean, do you think it's the goalies are getting better? Like as the season goes, is it guys are getting tired or is it the defense and the goalies are figuring out the trends? What do you think is a bigger part of it? Wow. That's a great question. I haven't probably thought that much about, but I think the the one thing you will see is it tends to go in waves up and down. So if, and, and early in the season, it does tend to be the, uh, the scorers that have a bit of an edge you'll see higher scoring games i think part of it is that offense for one is a bit easier to play in in the terms of you just you're being creative you're making stuff up um a lot of you know there's set plays and there's patterns you follow and you follow a system but there's a lot of creativity a lot of stuff that you're doing on the fly and just by real feel whereas defense you've got to work on the communication so Teams gel better defensively as the season goes on, I think, for the most part, whereas the offense can click pretty much right away. I think the other factor is a lot of these players are coming from playing in summer lacrosse, where for the most part, the nets are a little narrower, three inches narrower, right? So all of a sudden, you've got, you come to the NLL and the shooters have an extra three inches and the goalies have an extra three inches to cover. It changes their angles. When you talk to goalies the first time they play in the, in the pro nets, it's a huge difference because you're in a position where you've come out a certain amount. You're at a certain angle to this post. You're here and there, and you have your spot covered. And then all of a sudden, if you're in the same spot on the other net, the, the ball, you know, balls are a little under three inches across, right? Ball goes right in the corner, just inside the post. And you're like, oh, right, bigger net. So it, it takes a while. And, I mean, honestly, you see the reverse in the summer where guys come back from playing pro all winter and they start playing in WLA, MSL, junior leagues and that. And uh, they'll, and I've heard them say in, in pra, you know, practice in the, before the season, even when they say to the goalie, they'll hit a post and say, in the pro league, that's in three inches wide of that, that one's in. And the goalie will say, yeah, in the pro league, I'm covering that corner. <laughs> you know, whatever, like they have the debates, but the reality is it is, it is different. The other thing, of course, is the, um, I think the goalies, a lot of them use the wooden sticks in the summer, the big sticks, whether the wooden or the big plastic ones, a lot of them use the wooden sticks. So the cover just take away the five hole pretty much. Right. And then all of a sudden you get to the NLL and that five hole is open with the spoon sticks. And it's a big difference. And the guys, again, in the summer for the first few weeks, you see guys shooting five hole because they're used to there being openings and the goalie just stands there and it hits the stick and he says, ha. Huh. So, yeah, I think uh, I think that's a, a big factor is the cohesiveness you need on defense and the, the net change and the goalie gear change and everything. Yeah, it is a lot of stuff that you don't think about, really, when you're talking about all these leagues that, uh, yeah, the different size net. Because, like you said, most people three inches doesn't sound like much, but that is a goal, you know, a ball's width. And when you're talking yeah. about stepping out on the shooter, you don't want to go too far because most of these goalies, I mean, we've got some big goalies that'll cover it and it's not yeah. as big of a deal, but especially for like Del Bianco and your small athletic guys or like even Vince, you, it's really in position so much more important. Yeah. And I mean, the other factor when you talk about all this stuff is like you and me, if we're out there shooting three inches of net, 
I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's, it makes a bit of difference. It's not, it doesn't make that much difference. Like, I'm not that accurate, right? Like, you know, there are times I'll get one just inside the post when I'm aiming there. But honestly, there are lots of times I'm shooting for a corner and I hit the goalie in the middle of the chest. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of us at that stage. But these guys are so good. These pro athletes are incredible. And, uh, you know, you give a Josh Byrne or a, a Connor Fields or somebody, you know, the, that extra three inches to shoot. And uh, that's a lot. Now, not the terrible examples because neither of those guys really play summer box across. But, uh, you know, someone like a Ryan Smith who plays in the summer and then comes out and he's playing for Rochester and he has those three inches to shoot at and he's a deadly shooter. Um, you know, that's going to make a difference. You see the, uh, the five hole, when you just pointed that out, I was like, that is huge because some of the leagues allow the big wooden sticks and some don't, I didn't know that uh, all of them did up there too, because I know with can and that is a huge thing. And you'll see guys shooting for the five hole and you know, if you can hit just inside the foot, most of the time, as long as you're just on the inside of the foot, you're going to get it with a spoon stick versus that big wooden wall. You got to, it closes it up so much. I mean, how wide yeah. is that? Do you happen to know what the measurement is? Oh my God. But uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And honestly, I mean, if you look at Nick Rose in a summer net with the, with the Woody between his pads, yeah, you just, uh, there's, there's not a lot of net. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with a, a play by Alex Simmons, who highest scoring rookie in the league, Big star in the league in the making, right? And uh, he's in Calgary, and there's a there's a play where they take a shot, it's turned over, right? And Calgary's got the ball, they're coming out, and Seth Van Steppen takes a pass just by the uh, NLL logo there, um, about a little less than halfway from the restraining line to center. And Simmons is on his way. He sees what's happening, is alert. You can see the other Albany forwards up at the top running off, as they should be doing. He sees this play developing, realizes the chance. He comes on and is all over Van Sheppen, bangs Van Sheppen into the boards. Van Sheppen's right on it, but Simmons comes away with the ball, gets control, passes it off, and they set up. And he winds up you know, running the offense and finishes up with a really nice goal. As, as they run their full offense. And I mean, everybody gets involved here. It's a second chance offense. I, I don't, you know, not all the Calgary defenders got to switch up. And he takes this pass from Travis Longboat and just rips it just inside the post. And Christian Del Bianco gives him the death stare. But he said, it's like, you know, there's nothing he can do about it, right? That's just, that's just a great play. And that all started with the effort, the hustle uh, on the four check. And that's from Alex Simmons, you know, the biggest star in the team, really, I mean, even as a rookie. Yeah, and I noticed that, that four check and just put the pressure on. And yes, you might not score, but if it gives you two, three extra possessions and you're shooting 25% on the night, you know, you might get yeah. a goal just off of that. Mm -hmm. 100%. And and I think that's the important thing for young players to realize or anyone who's who's playing the game is to remember that that if you do something and it's a good play, it's a good, smart hustle, you know, high IQ lacrosse play and it doesn't wind up in a goal or doesn't even wind up in a shot on net, that doesn't mean don't do it again. Do it again. Because, or if it does wind up in a shot in the net and you don't score, you know, you're only going to score on, on average, about 20% of your shot as a team, right? In, in most leagues. So go do it again. Do it five times and you're probably going to produce a goal. Yeah, I like that. That uh, 20%, because that's something I've picked up with the stats is usually your your shooters, if they are shooting, you know, one out of four, 25%, that's usually when you can see teams winning. It's once they get way below that, I'm talking your guys that shoot 30, you know, 20 shots a night, not really 30. Not I don't know if anybody, Connor Fields might take no, 30, no. but other than that, I don't think anybody else in the league would get that close. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I mean, if you're in the sort of 17 to 20 range, you're doing okay. If you're 15 and below, it's probably not a great night or a great stretch for you. Um, if you're up 25 and above, that's amazing. Like that's, if you're as a team shooting 25%, you should win. Um, there aren't many nights that, that you will lose. And uh yeah, no, it's it's interesting to see, and you've got to you've got to play percentages. Dave Huntley, um, legendary lacrosse coach, and just one of the all time great guys, absolute beauty in the game of lacrosse. He used to, when he was coaching the Philadelphia Wings, he told his guys this was with like Jeff Snyder and Ethan Iannucci and and the group playing, and he said, look, the best goalies in the league stop about eighty percent of the shots they face. So if we can take hundred shots in a game, we should get twenty goals, and that was the approach they took, and it was mayhem. 
I mean, it was like they there was no shot they didn't like. It was like now, obviously, if you're taking lower quality shots, your percentage goes down. But they would push and push, and they would take the shot. And if they're like, should I shoot here? I'd pretty much say, yeah, yeah, we should shoot those shots. And then on defense, just try not to give them shots, just pressure them, you know. And we're getting the positions where they're not going to take the shots. And and uh, it's it, there's a lot more to it. He was a very very smart lacrosse guy. There's more than just let's shoot a lot, but uh, pretty simple system when you think about it. Anyway, we're going to talk about the other play, the uh, the other Alex Simmons play, also inc- including involving Travis Longboat. And this is a beauty where Simmons, it's it's late in the game. There's six minutes left. Albany's down by a goal. And Alex Simmons is going to get the ball and carry it around the top of the formation. And it's it's a shot where, again, in a pressure situation, you kind of expect this is your guy. He knows he needs to do things to make make the team successful. And I thought there were a couple points early in the season where Alex Simmons was forcing shots a bit because he was, you could tell he was thinking, I have to make stuff happen. I, you know, if we're down a bit, I need to go and score. And that's, it's aberrant. And I don't think it comes from selfishness at all. I think it's the exact opposite is that he knows his role with the team, but he has learned. He gets this, this ball and runs around and you see it. The, the view from the top is really nice because you can see how far across he comes and how hard it is for him to see Travis Longboat back on the far side of the floor. And he doesn't look over there. He establishes where Longboat is and that there's going to be a passing lane at a certain point. You watch all the replays as you go through and you can tell he doesn't look to make the pass when he makes the pass really, because if he looks over there, all the defenders are turning with him, especially Eli Salama, who's right on the crease. But because he throws the no look pass, everyone's having to respect him as their top scorer and come across. He throws it back to the far side. Longboat catches the pass and just makes a nice little move to tuck it over the shoulder on the far side, really quick shot before the defenders can adjust. And uh, it's just, I mean, it's just a great play that uh, would be so easy to overlook. Because if he took that shot, Alex Simmons, you're not going to blame him. He's got an open lane to the net. Uh, It's on his offside, but it's not a bad shot to take. But he makes that one more, and that leads to a tying goal and forces overtime that they, you know, that they almost won. Okay, so the next play we're going to talk about here is a huge goal. Uh, this is not our uncommon highlight of the week because this is a fairly common highlight. You're going to see this highlight everywhere. We are looking at a bit of an uncommon element of it. This is the Tom Schreiber goal at the end of Halifax Toronto in the final minute, ties the game up and forces overtime. And of course, they go on to win it on the Mark Matthews overtime goal on a on a uh, great pass up by Schreiber to hit Matthews after Schreiber come back in transition defense. But I, what I want you to watch is Mitch to snoop. Schreiber takes the shot. So he sets it for someone else. Schreiber takes the shot and Warren Hill makes the save. Warren Hill dives out to pounce on top of the loose ball on the rebound. And I watched this thing uh, dozens of times. And the one, the, the really nice thing, I'll watch it a lot of times on the uh, the Twitter highlights. So I watched back and forth, back and forth. Mitch to snoop reaches underneath and actually his stick, the, he rakes underneath the stick of Warren Hill and his stick hits the shaft of Warren Hill's stick, the he- and the angle of the head and onto the shaft and shoves it out of the way. The ball is there. Tom Shriver picks it up and then makes those amazing set of moves. Uh, I think John Abbott said something like, you know, uses his whole two kit, tool kit or some of his kit of moves or whatever it was. He's, it was. It was great. Like he just makes all the moves, was very patient because he saw Hill was had hopped up and was losing his balance and leaning back. So he waits and goes reverse whip when it's wide open and almost impossible for Hill to stop him. But watch the snoo knock this stick out of the way. And I watched it enough that I convinced myself that the snoo wasn't even trying to get the ball, that he was just trying to knock the stick out of the way for Schreiber to get it. And I was like, that's genius. So I thought, you know what? I don't know if that's true. So I called up Mr. Snoo and I said, hey, on that play, were you trying to get the ball or were you just trying to knock the stick out of the way? He said, well, the thing is, I know you can't slash the stick. I know you can rake under it. I've seen guys do it. Kyle Buchanan does it to us all the time. So I know you can't slash, but you can rake under. So I was I was just basically just reaching for the ball and going after it. And as he's reaching, the ball's moving. He'll stick is moving out. Um, but he knew, like, he was just trying to keep that ball available. He said, I didn't even, I didn't even know if I could get the ball, but I'm trying to keep it available. So he was, in a sense, doing what I was talking about, just not, I was like, because you watch it and you're like, oh my God, he got the shaft of the stick, which moves it more substantially than if you just, if you hit the head of the stick, of the goalie stick, it might rotate, right? 
but you hit the shaft and the whole thing moves out of the way. And you can see the stick moves out of the way, the ball's there, Schreiber gets it, and on we go, and there's your tying goal. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool that uh, that it, it was. I mean, and I, I said to him, like, if you actually thought, oh, I'm not going to pick up the ball, I'm going to, because I'm not in as good a position as Tom, I'm going to move the stick out of the way, and I'll just keep going and take that lane away or whatever. If you thought all that in the moment between the ball hitting Hill, and it being available there. Yeah, that, I mean, Mr. Sue's a brilliant guy. He's doing an MD slash PhD program at the University of Toronto. He's, he's doing all this like molecular research. He's, he may be a genius scientifically, but nobody is that smart <laughs> that quickly on the lacrosse floor. But he did make a really smart play to just rake for that ball and, and create that opportunity for Schreiber. And watching it in slow-mo and several times, you he does look like he's just pushing the stick out of the way and goes in his head kind of turns towards the ball, but yeah, no, his stick direction never changes. And I was, what actually caught my attention first was none of that stuff with the snoo, obviously, because you know, I would have had to have a more nuanced opinion and I automatically go to the defense and I am like, how does nobody take the body? You've got a goalie there, Warren Hill. And I'm like, okay, Clark Peterson, he stands there screening Hill that but he does. He, he doesn't play defense, but when you watch Withers run by him and yeah, same Tyson Bell stays back in the net. Yeah. Withers runs to block the shot and just spins around. Oh my goodness. I, I always watch that and I'm like, why did somebody not push the body out? I can literally hear my coach yelling at me if I did something like that. Yeah. And I mean, the thing, like you have roles, you have a, a system that you play in and it's i mean clark peterson's not a defender he does go back and play some some decent defense for them but we talked about this before with um tyson bell directing directing peterson right when peterson goes back he hustles back and plays great transition defense then when they get set up he's got people directing him like hey go over here and that happens with all the forwards who come back the d guys will say go over here go to the bottom go to the top wherever they want them where they think they can be the most effective with and and the least dangerous for their team to have out there because you know the other team's looking for the the old guy on d and you'll see like i i mean there are times i've talked to you i think about where one d guy will literally if there's an old guy or a, a rookie who's who doesn't really know the system yet i've seen d guys actually step out and cross check their their teammate into position if they're yelling at them they're not hearing they'll get out and just put their back on it they're stuck on their back and just shove them out to where they're supposed to be so you know you don't you're not going to blame peterson there um guys there are lots of things happening a lot of quick stuff going on you see that ball you want to get that ball and schreiber kind of comes from around a morass of people right so it's it's tough but you've got you do you you've got to hit him i mean he needs to be there needs to be a physical play there but uh boy everyone's going for the ball and if they come up with it you don't notice right but again go back to the basketball analogy when there's a shot you look for the closest guy when there's a shot coming and you block him out now that, that was my thing in basketball because i wasn't i'm always a huge scorer but if there was a shot going up i was getting my i was turning around and get my butt in your stomach and uh and making you not want to try and get through me for a loose ball for a rebound yeah, no, 100%. And that's why I, you know, say it from that perspective, whatever I watch is just, yeah. no, if somebody needs to be on him, pushing him out, he has so much time. I, yeah, it's, uh, my dad used to always say, he set up camp in front of the net before anybody got to him, put his feet up. Yeah. He's got a soda. He's hanging out. He's building yeah. sandcastles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, uh, I remember I was calling a game once and, uh, and that guy gets the ball right on top of the crease and seems to take forever and puts it in. And as I'm calling it, I, I make the call and I say, oh, nice pass, nice shot. I'm like, somebody has to hit him. And uh, I think it was uh, Ottawa Capital Flax might have been, somebody tweeted tweeted it, you know, tweeted right after with the quote saying, you know, after this goal and quoted me saying, somebody's got to hit him and just saying, he's not wrong. <laughs> somebody's got to hit that guy. Like that's that's the nature of defense, right? Is uh, is know where the guys are and hit them. But boy, it's it's hard to do i mean it's that's why some people are really really good at it when it seems like it's just getting in the way of things and hitting people uh it doesn't seem too intellectual sometimes it takes a lot of brains to to play the defensive game this week's uncommon highlight of the week brought to you by uncommon fit providers of great lacrosse gear for folks great uh clothing custom clothing and apparel the uncommon fit highlight of the week look at this zach courier takes a look up at the, at the clock and realizes, hey, there's, well, he knows that when this shot is taken, there's about 40 seconds left. 
So he knows I don't want to pick this ball up for 10 seconds until there's 30 seconds left so we can get a timeout and be able to run a play with the goalie pulled, pull W off, get the extra attacker and not have to worry about any of a, any gap between the shot clock and the game clock. And uh, yeah, it's 39 seconds left when he, he looks up and he sees a player coming. He's getting pressured by Ethan Walker, taps it behind the net, goes all the way around behind the net and then goes back, taps it back the other direction to go the other way with a guy. It's unbelievable. You see guys do this, you know, when there's like three or four seconds, they'll just stand there and not pick it up and look at the clock and wait till somebody comes after them. Or they'll just kind of tap it along for a bit. I don't know if I've ever seen somebody do this for 10 plus seconds to get this. I, it, was, it was great. And I mean, it even flummoxed the announcers for this game. Uh, they're saying, oh, he's going to have trouble getting getting the ball over center in time. It's like, no, the possession's never started. The, I think the confusing thing is, the, whoever's running the 30 second clock started the 30 because you have to reset it on the on the shot right so they did the right thing they reset it but there'll be there's another reset as soon as he picks it up because that's when possession is established if you don't pick the ball up there's no possession you're tapping it along like a hockey player there's no possession and courier no surprise i mean he's a princeton guy did i think engineering he's a very smart lacrosse player in person and he knows he can do this and very you have to be very confident in your skills too because I'll tell you, it looks pretty bad if you're trying to do this and they just pick it up and go score. But uh, this is a terrific play by Zach Courier and they get the timeout and they get to go down and run a play. And I don't even remember if they scored when they set it up. I don't think they did. Um, but who cares, right? Because you give them, like we talked about earlier in the show, that gives them the chance to set that up. And you do that a few times and you're going to, you know, the, the scoring percentage is a bit higher than 20, I think, on you know, on six on five sets or on five on four sets, if you can get them to do that. So yeah, you're, you're giving yourself your team a one in three or four chance to, uh, to go and get a goal. Yeah, no. And uh, that was right before, you know, the end of regulation. That's a huge play 31 mm -hmm. seconds when he actually picked up the ball. So there was, you know, the one second over, yeah. but they were still able to pull the goalie. And uh, no, as soon as you know, when you see that, it's like, okay, they didn't score. That's the uncommon highlight. Because if they scored there, that would have been the highlight of the week. Everybody would have been talking about yeah, how smart probably. Courier is. And wow, look at the way he set his yeah. team up. But, you know, because they didn't score, me and you were the only ones talking about it with the uncommon highlight. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing, as I watched it and he picked it up, I thought, there's like 30 and a half seconds. Why didn't you wait for another second? <laughs> Because at that point, he was wide open. There's nobody near him. I'm like, Zach, what are you doing? I felt like texting his dad and saying, what's he doing picking it up with one second left <laughs> before the 30? But, you know, no, it's, it's a good play. And, I mean, the thing is, he's done that for nine or ten seconds. He's gone around behind, gone back. It, it, it's not always easy to see exactly how much time now. The thing is, he's running right by. He, you can see the 30 because, like I said, the 30 is reset because of the shot. So you have a good idea. But he also had to know exactly – how much time was on the game clock. And I think he was thinking, get to 20 and we're good. So he picks it up. Um, but so, yeah, no, it was, it was brilliant. Yeah, no, it was. Because he actually, when he gets it in his stick, uh, I was doing the frame by frame. It's 30.9 seconds. So, I mean, they, you know, they gypped him out of a hundred or a tenth of a second. But uh, yeah. <laughs> still, it didn't affect the uh, the end of it. And actually, yeah. the uh, they didn't really get a great shot. But that has nothing to do with, you know, how great of a play yeah. that was by him. Exactly, exactly. We've got one more play we're going to look at, and this one, it's a strange one, and it's its a play that takes place over the course of about 20 minutes in real time, because the end of the first half, Saskatchewan is leading Georgia four to nothing. Astonishing that you can shut out Georgia for 30 minutes. And I remember thinking, it's just getting close to halftime, and Saskatchewan's up four nothing. They've come in from their game the night before where they lost to New York and they had to travel. And, you know, the announcers have talked about, or the, I think the sideline announcer was, reporter was talking about how they'd only had about three hours of sleep and then they had to get on the plane and they get here and they just, they got very little sleep, very little rest. They had to do the best they could for recovery. And I remember thinking, if you go into the second half up four to nothing, you are probably in a fair bit of trouble. I think Georgia's going to come back and win this game because all that travel stuff, is harder in the second half because the first half you come, you're, you're focused, you're doing everything you can. You come, you do your warm up, you got a nice long warm up, and you you know you get going and you can be ready to go and you can play the first half. And then you have to go and sit for 12 minutes. Or, you know, it's around 12 minutes between halves, right? It is really, really hard to come out physically and mentally 
and emotionally in the second half and play the same way. And uh, I thought that was that was uh, I, I thought I, I thought Georgia was probably going to come back and win this game. But you kind of pull for a team that's in that travel situation and and it worked so hard. And then I thought, wow, you're going to give Zach Manns a penalty here. Five six seconds left. He drives the net, takes a shot, tries to jump out of the way of Brett Dobson. Goes out, make sure he avoids the post, avoids the goalie, jumps wide around it. Like you can see his body language, his steps, his whole body is pulling himself away. Dobson, who is very adamant about players not coming into his crease. As you know what? I don't blame goalies for protecting their crease. They don't get a lot of area they get to protect. I don't blame them. He, Dylan Ward is the same way. It's like, they'll be like, don't come in my crease. I don't care. I don't care if I came out and made contact. But Dobson comes out and makes contact. I mean, there's no question. You watch this one. And it's Gobson that initiates the contact. And I saw the hand go up from the referee, and I thought, whoa, is that – he's giving Dobson a penalty? Because it didn't even occur to me that he could give fans a penalty. There's no way, right? And I thought, that's pretty soft goalie on the penalty, really. Uh, and then I see this on man, so I'm like, oh, come on. And you see the replay, and you think, there is absolutely zero way that's a penalty. And the thing is, like – and I talked about this in my musings this week on IL Indoor, that, you know – Players go in at halftime and the coaches talk to them about what they've done and what they should have done. You know, you did this and you did that. You know those three reps are in there and they're saying, why'd you call that on man? He dove two feet to the side to try and miss the guy. So we come out for the second half and I'm thinking, oh, poor Saskatchewan. They've had all this travel stuff and now they go on the on the penalty kill for the second half. And then, it's what, 30 sec- 36 seconds in, I think, they make the call. Um, Adam Wiedemann holding the stick. And the funny thing is, we don't actually see it on the screen as the play gets as the play gets going in the second half, but you can see the stick of Saskatchewan player gets is on the turf and Wiedemann standing there nearby. And, and I have no idea if he grabbed the stick, if he just kind of brushed it and the player dropped it. Who knows? But honestly, something was going to get called there <laughs> in that first possession. That's people ask officials and that if they if there are makeup calls in the game and they, you know, if they're still refing, they may say, no, 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 of course there are, you know, you're human. If you're refing a game and you screw up a call, you know, you're going to try and balance that out. Even if it's not consciously, you're going to be, you know, that's a tough situation. You've put a team in by making a call that as soon as your hand went up, you're like, Oh, what did I do? You know, and these are, I mean, these are good refs. Like I know everyone loves to rip on the refs, but these are the best refs around and uh, you know, they know what they're doing, but everybody makes mistakes. And uh, I, I just love that we got the makeup call in the second half because I think I think that made it fair. You know, gave uh, gave uh, some four on four play, which is exciting. Everybody enjoys it, and then Saskatchewan gets a little a little uh, brief power play Wait at the end of it after Georgia had theirs. Wiedemann did not want to hear that. You could see the uh, the look on his face. He did not want to hear anything about a makeup call. <laughs> no, He's he like, didn't. it's not my fault that you did that. <laughs> right. Well, and that's the thing from his perspective. He probably, he may not have done anything. He may have grabbed the guy's stick. I, I really don't know. I didn't see it. Yeah. He probably did. They usually do. But, you know, it's, and it, and it, again, it's been 15, 20 minutes since that happened. But uh, you also go back and look at the look on Zach Manz's face. And he's saying, I think he's saying, what the, you know, like when he's in the penalty box, because he's like, how am I getting a penalty on that? I literally tried to jump out of the way. And yeah, you know, so Zach, it's okay. You were, you were vilified, validated, vilified. I don't know. Yeah, validated and vilified. He was va- he yeah. was vilified so they could validate their other call. There you go. <laughs> All right. So as we look at the way the uh, the playoffs are shaping up, which team yeah. that's in the top eight is not going to be in the top eight when the season's over? That's a great question, and it's you know it's it's so interesting to look at the standings and think. I, you really have to get into the who people are playing, where the tiebreakers are. And it's it's hard because I look at those top eight teams and I think, yeah, you know, I mean, Panther City's playing well, but not as consistent as some of the, you know, teams that have been more established, have a little more long identified and established identity, but they're playing well. They're earning their way in there. Um, it's hard to imagine the Bandits not making it. Um, New York is, is, you know, it's easy to say the team sitting in eighth, um, is the, the most vulnerable, but they've been had stretches of really good lacrosse and some stretches of really not very good lacrosse, right? They're still a youngish team that's that's developing, again, their identity. Um, they, they seem, to me, the most vulnerable. Um, I kind of look at it the other way 
almost in, which of the teams that aren't in right now have a really good shot at getting in. And uh, I, I mean, again, Rochester's a team you look at sitting in ninth, just out of a spot. And they were so good at times. Right. And uh, they win some big games, but then they've been so bad. They give up a ton of goals. They give up a ton of goals. Uh, they score. They're the leading scoring team in the league in goals per game. And they've given up seven more goals than they've scored. That doesn't sound like a playoff team, but they can win any game they're in. They can just run you out of the building. Um, I, I think Saskatchewan before the weekend, I thought had a really good chance. Um, obviously losing those two games just crushed it for them. That's, that's really tough. I think that took them out of it. I, they were the one I would have said if they'd at least split um, and then been able to take their other game this uh, Thursday coming up against, um, against Philadelphia, the makeup game of the one that was snowed out. I thought they had a good chance. I think Calgary really looks like a club. I mean, look in the, the teams that aren't in the playoff positions right now. Calgary's my um, pick. Yeah. Well, yeah. Calgary's the only team that's a plus in goals for and against. And there's a reason for that. They've lost some very close games. They've got Christian Del Bianco playing the way he did last year when he was the MVP and goalie of the year. Way better. I mean, he was playing well early in the season. He's playing way better than he was then. You've got, I mean, you've got guys like Courier. Shane Simpson has been outstanding. And, you know, you've got Jesse King, one of the great leaders in the game, is, is uh, directing an offense that's, you know, that's really come on. You've got Tyler Pace. I, I just think Calgary's playing very well. And it's a bit more of a surprise that they're out of a playoff position than it would be if they were in, you know? Yeah, I think it's going to be Panther City and Calgary flipping spots. Other than that, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see the way Rochester, like you said, gives up goals that they're going to make it. And I mean, Halifax has had moments like that too, but yeah, yeah I think Panther City is going to be out. And I just, I, I watched a lot of the Calgary games, which might make me a little biased, but you see a lot of the games they've lost are one and two goal games, and you got to expect. I know Josh Courier has gotten on the board now, but are not Josh that career, but you, I would expect him to, to start scoring. Yeah. I think the other thing with, I actually had Halifax as, as a team marginal to make the playoffs in my preseason predictions. Uh, it seemed like everyone was picking them to be a top four, top five team. And, you know, they may well be right now. They're, they're in that second group of playoff teams, right? Looking at like a road playoff team in the first round. Yeah. They're five. And, uh, yeah. You know, like they're, they're kind of sitting in there, but, uh, I, I, they're going to make it, I would think, probably because they're playing Rochester, Vancouver, and Colorado uh, in their last three games. So that, that's got to help. I mean, none of those are easy games. Like we said, Rochester can score. Vancouver's playing really well. Put up 21 last week, right, <laughs> against Philly. Their defense is playing well. Aiden Walsh has been he's, – he's suddenly – he's been an overnight sensation that took like two or three years, right? to develop one of those guys that he's been working at. He's been practice, you know, practicing and backup goalie. And when he's come into play, he hasn't been very good as most young goalies are not early on. And all of a sudden they obviously knew he was ready or they, you know, obviously Kurt Miloski was like, I think you're ready because he's played the last five games and he's been really good for them. So none of those are easy Colorado. I mean, they're not an easy team to beat, right? They've shown they can take anybody, but you are playing three teams out of the playoff positions and, and two of the bottom three teams in the league, you have to think that's a better situation than some of the challenging schedules that some of the, the other teams have. Well, that's, I'm looking through Albany and they do not have an easy road because you've got Panther city. So if they're still in the contention, they're going to mm -hmm. be, you know, and we've got Toronto one more time and then it's New York who at that point, it may be a, a you know, a must win for them to stay in and, yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, I tell you, everybody said that 10 wins was going to be the magic number, but you're really, uh, I mean, it, it is the magic number, but yeah. you're still going down as far as trying to get playing in Buffalo. That's a huge mm -hmm. advantage for Buffalo. Like there's places that home, uh, you know, home advantage actually means something. Some of these guys, you wonder, cool. they all fly in. Is it really like that? But like Buffalo, they've got a bunch of guys that live there and their crowd mm -hmm. is nuts. They can really take over a game. It's uh, it's, it's a unique experience. And, and Calgary's got the same environment. That's why I see them doing well. Yeah. I, I don't know, just being able to get that emotional few wins. Yeah. Cool. Albany beat Buffalo in Buffalo with 18,000 people there. Albany's the so, exception to the rule. That's yeah, the uh, Albany yeah. has is the kryptonite to the bandits. When you look through, yeah. I mean, overall they Buffalo. I'm yeah. not going to say they've won every game. Uh, Albany hasn't, but Buffalo has 
had their number. It's just the way their style lines up good with how they play against Buffalo. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Clark, Clark does very well against them. Yeah. Well, it's funny because the, uh, you look at the other side for Albany and uh, they were losing was it two years ago when they were a couple of years ago when they were pretty competitive, but they lost all their games to Rochester. I think it was or New York, like one of the new teams. And they, they're like the only people losing to them. And they lost them three times in the season. Yeah, and, and then had a play-in game in, in Buffalo where they lost by one goal at yeah. the end. That was their first season in Albany. It was uh, yeah. We drove out to Buffalo to watch the game, and that was my first yeah. time in Buffalo, and I was like, wow, this is something and something special. It's really something. Yes, absolutely. So this week's Uncommon Fit jersey is a bit of an homage to a story on IL Indoor this week by Adam Levy about franchise relocation and expansion. He talks about teams moving and, you know, changing names and expansion teams that come and go and things. And that is about the NLL, but the same thing does happen in Canadian summer lacrosse. I don't have any like Syracuse smash jerseys or, or anything handy. So um, I am wearing this jersey, Red Oaks. Can you see it okay? Oh, tilt a little bit more. There we go. Lovely Red Oaks jersey. Do you know, Gregor, pop quiz. Do you know who this is from? What what town? What team? No idea. There you go. And a lot of people wouldn't, honestly. So this is a team that started. I'll tell you, they are a cornerstone franchise in Canadian senior lacrosse. Um, the second most man cups, I believe, of any franchise. They are. They get the biggest crowds in the country. A have franchise. We talked about the haves and the have-nots. Since the early 1950s, when they started up and started winning, they've been the Timberman, the Trailerman, the Mercuries, the Speedy Urns, the Pepsi Peets, the Don Buys, then the Lakers in the National Lacrosse Association Pro League, uh, the Red Oaks, then the Lakers, then the Quakers, and since 1994, the Peterborough Lakers. They were the Peterborough Red Oaks from 1978 to 81. Red Oak Inn was the sponsor. It was the era of the... Uh, shopping mall boom there was a new shopping mall downtown peterborough it's called peterborough square and uh i was a teenager when that thing opened or just pre-teen i guess when that uh, when that opened and it was a huge uh, i guess it was earlier but the red oak inn was a uh a inn a hotel that was in the mall it was at the one end of the mall and it was like a pretty fancy place you know for folks coming in from out of town and and uh, they sponsored the the team that had been the lakers for five years uh peter red oaks and these were the jerseys and uh yeah it was uh it was it was pretty cool that that's now a uh, seniors residence and the whole mall is pretty much dead but uh that's that's the way things go with franchises and uh, people are hung around the lakers are hanging on uh there's always challenges teams come and go the game has survived um it's looking strong in a lot of ways there's always talk about can the nll survive uh, they're saying you know next major league as the marketing campaign which would be great i think the the possibility is there i also think you have to be careful because there, it's easy to go the other way as well so but uh homage to adam levy and il indoor and uh, the people of red oaks which was a terrific franchise i mean this was the team when i was uh when i was in high school and you know we're watching this club playing some uh, some pretty exciting exciting series and uh i actually remember the one man cup it would have been a bit after this where i went and got uh, my friend tim daladay and i uh, you know pete daladay calls the halifax thunderbirds games his brother tim and i went to school together we played football and basketball and lacrosse together and uh at least baseball we played at least four sports together and uh after one game we decided we were going to go down uh, the salmon bellies were in town and we loved their socks white bottom and then they had the blue and red and little black and white um, diagonal lines going across so cool and we went down to their dressing room after the last game um, after they just lost to peterborough actually, and asked the play a couple of the players if we could have their socks and they're like you want our socks these are gross man like they just finished playing we're like yeah yeah so we got their socks and we go and uh i've washed them a few times <laughs> and, uh, and then we go when we and we actually started up around then a uh bobby allen the great bobby allen that the backhand shot is named after uh was a vice principal i think at the school started up 
a lacrosse, a field lacrosse team at Adam Scott, our high school. And our first practices before the snow cleared were in the gym. And Tim and I were there wearing our salmon belly socks for the, uh, for the first practices for the Adam Scott lacrosse team. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how I got on that whole thing. That's, but, uh, uh, <laughs> that's cool though. And I, that's gotta yeah. be really cool. So the red Oak, so immediately you knew yeah. which team it was then that's a, uh, that's a pretty cool throwback to, you know, when you were yeah. in high school, that's gotta be neat because yeah. like you, so many of these, we've got a, uh, semi-pro hockey team that has changed names several times. So yeah, it'd yeah. be like if I saw a frostbite Jersey or uh, yeah, that is, that's, that's yeah. really cool. So a uh, huge shout out to uncommon fit and the hidden highlight and the retro jerseys. That is something that uncommon fit does a lot of check out their, uh, their website, get a hold of Jamie, check out all the retro gear. They've got a lot. It's, it's pretty impressive. And the retro jerseys are always cool. I love wearing it because then, you know, it just starts the question. So that way now I'll, yeah. you know, I'll know that and I'll be able to pass that along, but I actually have on my nation's cup hoodie yeah. from, uh, Onondaga as we get ready to go I'm just building the stream profile right now I've got the uh the Thanks. games all lined up we're gonna be uh I'm on the fence right now if I'm purchasing the uh the microphones for the refs the uh the wi-fi you know oh really yeah I'm I'd love to get like them but out in the game or when they announce the penalties no so when they announce the penalties they could just flip yeah. it on and say it so I uh yeah. that might be coming soon I got it wow yeah pretty exciting so we'll, we'll see we we've we have uh, upgraded a lot over the winter with uh, a lot yeah. of little little doodads here and there, and hopefully it makes Thanks. things a lot smoother. So as always, thank Looking you so much. Doing some games this summer. Hey, one yeah. I'm I'm really pushing for a Montreal Caribous jersey. So uh, Plunk, <laughs> find me a, a nice big Montreal Caribous jersey because uh, that, that was before my time. But the old uh, the or the first NLL I think it was or the second one of the versions of the NLL, and uh, just a great uniform. Great. Uh, I'm pretty sure Terry Sanderson played for that team and uh yeah and they're just great jerseys and it's a cool name and and i'm hoping that uh, if a team team does come to laval that they're the caribous i doubt they will be but i think it'd be pretty fun yeah that would be sweet and especially the uh the retro jerseys we're actually having this uh the next home game for albany is uh attack jerseys so a, a shout out to the old albany attack very nice. Which actually was here when I was in high school, but I was so busy playing hockey that I never went down and didn't even know what it was. So even though we had the team 40 minutes away, I never made it to a game because it was during hockey season. And it was just like, yeah, I'm not, yeah we can't miss something to go watch yeah. something that I, I kind of played field. And this sport, I was just yeah. told is, yeah, I wish I had yeah. now, but. Yeah, yeah, I know. It is what it cool. is. Cool. All right, Good thanks, stuff, man. Yeah, thanks so thanks, much. Buddy. Everybody, yeah. make sure you check out all the uh, links in the description. Check out Steven Stamp at IL Indoor Lacrosse. Click the link and so much. And there's so many other writers there, too. They talk about Adam Levy or Levy. I always say that wrong. I'm sorry, Adam yeah. Levy. And, uh, yeah, the retro uniforms and going back through the teams is always a blast because that's how I've learned so much just with how many of these leagues there have been throughout the years. Yeah, you know, Bruce Codd was one of the leading scorers for the Montreal Express. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> and and Jason Crosby, the O coach for the New York Riptide, what is the Montreal Express career penalty minute leader. <laughs> That's awesome. That's one of my favorite stats. All right. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll do it again next week. Sounds good.